like to introduce our first guest speaker, Matthew Coles. So Matthew Coles is senior principal product security engineer at Dell Technologies. He's experienced security architect and security program leadership, defining and delivering security programs, processes, and secure system architecture, expertise across the product lifecycle, enabling security, privacy, and safety of complex systems with practices such as threat modeling and architecture analysis, code analysis, security testing, secure supply chain, and manufacturing, and vulnerability and incident response, strong communication skills to deliver timely and actionable information to both technical and non-technical audiences, focus on practical security solutions founded in secure systems engineering with the goal of proactively avoiding and mitigating security risks to support business objectives. I welcome you, sir. All right, hi everyone. I'm Matt Coles. Let me just go ahead and share my screen here. Hi, so I'm Matt Coles, as was mentioned. Uh, I go by Matt, more Matthew, either one. Uh, you can, let's see, see on the screen here, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Coles under Matthew J uh, in, on Twitter. So I'm gonna to talk today about threat modeling and give a primer of threat modeling. Uh, this, is, this is part one of a two-part talk uh, you'll, you'll get is ours portion uh, following. So a little bit more about uh, about me. I'm, again, Matthew Goals. I'm a security professional with uh, a CSSLP, Certified Software Systems Lifecycle Professional. And I have a Master's of Science in Computer Science from Worcester Polytechnic Institute here in the United States. Uh, I've been working with uh, device and system ecosystems uh, to make them help them be secure. And my my keywords here, the roles that I play, really, you know, advisor, influencer, educator, mentor, and more importantly, partner with business to help with that and enable that security. Uh, along with these, I've co-authored uh, a book on threat modeling that's available through O'Reilly or Amazon, other places. Uh, and we're both members of the Threat Modeling Manifesto, which we'll be talking about at length for this presentation. Uh, and you can actually catch us also on uh, DEF CON 29 video for AppSec Village presenting on the topic of DFDs or data flow diagrams. Uh, disclaimer that I'm speaking here of my own, with my own views and not of my employers. Uh, while I work at Dell, uh, my, my work in threat modeling and some of the roles I play are not uh, for my employer I'm here to present as a professional. So, Threat Modeling Manifesto. So, the Threat Modeling Manifesto uh, was put together uh, by a working group uh, that consists of myself and 14 other uh, experienced people, uh, very much experts in the threat modeling space, um, from uh, practitioners or uh, academics, um, whether it's from security or privacy standpoint, uh, and we all came together to discuss the issues of threat modeling, how threat modeling is to be, how threat modeling should be done or can be done. Uh, what are the best ways to think about threat modeling and sort of what's it's out, what are their outcomes? And we had some, some quite lengthy debates and, and quite, uh, quite good conversation. Uh, we did record the sessions. So you actually can take a look at uh, security journey has, um, two part series that go into the specifics of the Threat Modeling Manifesto working group and how we came to the decisions that we did. Uh, and then you'll see the link also for the threatmodelingmanifesto.org uh, where you can find a copy of the manifesto. So one of the key things we did with the manifesto, of course, uh, modeling it after the Agile Manifesto uh, was to first set, set the stage as what, what threat modeling is, right? So what, what is this activity of threat modeling? And then, you know, so what are what are some of the parameters or, or guidelines that that we would expect, you know, hope and want to express to the community around threat modeling, right? So first off, what is threat modeling? And so with conversation amongst the, the collection of experts, we really came down to this, this really concise definition for what threat modeling is. So threat modeling is the process of analyzing representations of a system to highlight concerns about security and privacy characteristics. All right, so let's break that down just a little bit. We'll, we'll dive into these in a little bit more detail in a moment. But basically, 
you know, threat modeling is the process of looking at a system and specifically looking at representation of the system uh, and to highlight areas of concern, you know, uh, specifically in security and privacy, but there may be other areas that, that folks may find of concern. So this, this sets the stage of what threat modeling is. Now, how you do threat modeling uh, can can take a couple of different forms. I know mean, many there are many different ways to do threat modeling. There, there are there are dozens of ways uh, documented on how to do threat modeling, but really almost all of them can be bro broken down to basically a four question framework. And and we one of the members of the threat modeling working group, Adam Shostak, who's a luminary in the space around threat modeling, uh, published this four question framework, which really says it all. Right? It it really gives us four steps to doing threat modeling. Uh, and and any process that fault that does threat modeling basically does this to you know to some extent right identifying what you're working on uh, creating that system representation identifying then what can go wrong with respect to privacy or security and identifying threats figuring out what we're going to do about it so after we do the modeling and the identification uh, processes we then have to solve the problems that we find, right? So we're gonna look at identifying mitigations and then figure out at some point, did we do a good enough job, right? Did we reduce the threats uh, and the severity and the risk down to a manageable level or eliminate them entirely? And so every every threat modeling process follows this in some ex to some extent, whether you're following uh, Stride or Tara or continuous threat modeling or any of the other number of, of available options uh, it basically follows this process. And so this is part of the threat modeling manifesto for that reason, because this is this is the root of what threat modeling, how you would perform threat modeling. So let's get a little bit more detail here. So what are we working on, right? Again, building a system representation. When we build a system representation, what we're really doing is creating a model of a system. And we specifically create a model of the system because we don't want to build the system, right? If we build the system, we spend a lot of engineering time and effort. So we really want to make a, a, a model of that so that we can we can analyze it with ease without having to reconstruct the system as a whole. Because some of the systems that we do threat modeling for can be very, very complex. At its basic level, we're going to cover, we're going to identify a set of things in the system representation, right? We're going to identify elements of the system and interactions between those elements and attributes on both the elements and the interactions. And then separately, and, and I've held it separately here, we'll talk about it in a moment uh, with respect to the manifesto itself, but we'll also identify a set of assets. Now assets here need not be just data. This could also be functionality uh, or anything really of value, right? And so we're gonna collect a, a set of things, elements, interactions, and attributes, and identify things of value. And that becomes our system representations, right? So that's what we're, working on. Now, this need not be uh, a software system. This could be a hardware system. This could be a mixed you know, hardware and software system. It could be processes. The elements interactions here do not are not bound to software only. Uh, and so, and, and nor are the assets, by the way. Assets could be human or not human, <laughs> as an example. So first stage was, what are we working on, right? Building this representation. And, and building this representation about how, how strict you go and what you do, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. A little bit. Uh, a little bit more detail on system representation to sort of highlight what we're talking about here. So when we talk about elements, we want to talk, we want to identify processes or data and to identify sort of who trusts what, right? So these shapes, uh, this rounded rectangle, this you know, database looking thing, and these this dotted line comes from uh, DFD3, which is one of the stencil options when it comes to doing threat modeling. Uh, and so we want to look at a set of process. We want to identify processes, things that do stuff within, within the system. We want to look at data and especially where data is stored. Uh, and then And then we want to identify, again, a set of sort of the boundaries of how things are 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 trusting each other. Uh, and 
trusting can be an interesting thing because trust is not uh, is not symmetrical in all cases. Uh, and if you're and, and want to be careful of and and don't get confused by zero trust versus trust boundaries in a in a threat model. They mean slightly different things, or they mean different things, and you use the trust boundary for purposes of analysis later. When we talk about interactions, there's really uh, one shape to worry about. It's an arrow. Arrows can be unidirectional or bidirectional, and they indicate that there's there's some sort of communication path, uh, some sort of data flow that occurs between the different parts of the system. Uh, I didn't mention it in elements. The square box is an external entity, things that are outside of the system under scope, but they still interact with the system that we care about. I also uh, will bring in, uh, there's, this is this little tick mark here is a, an extension um, that, that I've been recommending and, and that actually Izar and I put in our, in our book, uh, which provides some additional information when you're building your system model uh, to provide information to the, to the viewer as to which process initiates communications. And so this, this model here is, is a representative system that can then, do, and then be analyzed. And then we identify the attributes, right? So in this particular case, we have A, which is a process. It's written in C++. We have B, which is a data store, and it's in SQLite. And then we write, you know, process D writes to, writes to the database PII data. And from this information, from these elements and these interactions and these attributes, we're able to take that system and analyze it. And then how do we do that is an interesting question. As a security professional, I look at that and go, oh yeah, we, we have some problems here, right? Something runs as root. We have a potential with uh, third-party components uh, and we're writing PII data, which means we really need to make sure that that database is secure. But how did I know that? Well, I have a lot of experience doing systems engineering and, and systems development. And so when we come, when it comes to threat identification, we draw from our collective experiences, right? We draw from uh, security engineering principles that we may have learned in school that we read about online. Uh, if you're doing privacy, same thing, privacy principles may be available. And you have your personal views and biases as well as common sense uh, comes into a picture, right? If you have if you have very sensitive data and you have an insecure data store, you don't necessarily need a security engineering principle to know that you're going to have a, have an area of concern. You may bring in other things as well, uh, such as tactics, techniques, and procedures, things that adversaries bring to the picture, uh, previously known issues that you have identified, or threat patterns that somebody may have maybe have called out that you want to look for in your system. And so in the process of figuring out what can go wrong, you take this information and you synthesize it together. Uh, and so this is where the threat modeler or the threat analyst comes in. Now I'm using threat analyst here in a different way. This is not your traditional like uh, security operation setter threat analyst. Uh, somebody looking at a SIM for instance, looking for, for um, indicators of compromise. This is a, somebody, a practitioner who is looking at the system representation, using the information for threat identification and identifying a set of things, right? And those things are at least threats and potentially and most likely also include weaknesses and vulnerabilities, things that are flaws in the system that can be exposed and exploited and used by threats and threat actors to cause a problem. And then lastly, uh, and also as part of this process, you're going to want to identify mitigations that you can use in terms of what are we gonna do about it, right? What do we wanna do about the things that we find? Sorry, is there a question? Somebody is off mute. Monsi, are you asking a question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we wanna identify mitigations um, that, to the things we find, to the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, you know, maybe we patch patch a security defect or um, change out a component because there's there's an issue um, or perform, per, do something else to protect that network traffic, right? Uh, so that we can, we can figure out what we're working on, what we can go wrong and what are we gonna do about it? And then after afterwards, of course, we'll figure out, did we do a good enough, good enough job from from the system and from the threats that we are concerned about and the 
uh, and the threats we have identified and the weaknesses and whatnot, and we have the mitigations. Now, did we solve the problem, right? Did we do, reduce the risk to a, a low enough level? When it comes to just the, just for those who may not be familiar, and this is a badly rendered uh, word cloud, uh, for security and privacy engineering principles, things that we look for, things we, concepts that we understand as security pra practitioners or as developers, right? Most people, probably understand many of these things, you know, defense in depth, uh, having a secure element, only hardware folks may, may understand, may, may be familiar with that, um, but fail secure, fail, you know, fail safe, all these things, these are all the things that we look for. These are the principles and, and properties of a system that we look for. Uh, and there, and there are certainly going to be others that we look for when we do that synthesis, when we look at that model and we look for, sort of what is the what are the concerns that we have in this in the system and then we apply some of these things also when we talk about mitigations right so if we have data in a data store that needs to be protected we're going to want to protect that for confidentiality and so we apply certain patterns that shore up that confidentiality so here's a this is a this is sort of how everything ties together and the manifesto getting back to it provides the structure uh, by which we, we express, you know, this activity as a whole. So I'm going to finish out the, the manifesto and then we'll, I'll pass it on to my colleague for the next presentation. Uh, so the manifesto, as we talked about, had sort of had the definition. Now we have values, right? So when we talk about values of, of threat modeling uh, from the manifesto standpoint, we talk about this in this over that, right? So we, it is not that this is is better than well this over that meaning we prefer this over that <laughs> uh, and here i'll give you an example just to make this clear a culture of finding and fixing design issues over checkbox compliance it isn't that checkbox compliance is not important it's that we would prefer the threat modeling. Again, the, the set of experts who came together for the threat modeling manifesto, who have been doing this for combined decades of experience, uh, not that that necessarily means anything, but you know, we have, we've been here, <laughs> been here a while. Um, uh, we would prefer the threat modeling. It builds this culture of finding issues and not necessarily just doing it for compliance. If you're doing it just for compliance, obviously it has value, but it isn't necessarily the right value in our opinions, at least. Likewise, threat modeling should be about people and collaboration. It should be coming together to talk about a system and not necessarily strictly about the process and the methodology and tools. We'll talk about tools in a, in a little bit uh, and, and there's some important stuff to talk about there. Uh, we want and hope that folks, under, folks see threat modeling as a journey of understanding and not simply as a snapshot of security. Yes, it does that, but we really want it to be and, and it really should be part of sort of the thought process of an organization. We would certainly hope that people do threat model rather than just talk about threat modeling. Now we do a lot of I do a lot of presentations talking about threat modeling, but in my day job, I do a lot of threat modeling too, and that's it's, that's the goal, right? We really want people to do it, not 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 necessarily just talk about it. And lastly, continuous refinement versus single delivery. Threat modeling is a process; it's a journey. These keywords here, and really. The activity of threat modeling is something you should be doing on a regular basis, meaning as you build a system and you or you're designing a system, you may do a threat model and then as you refine the system, you're going to continue to refine that threat model. And you can do that all the way through, you know, out to and into release. So some of the principles that we've identified for threat modeling, uh, and I'll really focus on the, the highlighted words here, right, is that we want to in, that Threat modeling really should be focused around improving security and privacy of a system through early and frequent analysis. We talked about that continuous refinement process. Uh, threat modeling, in order to be uh, of value and be meaningful, uh, must align with your organization practices, right? So if you're building, if you're building a car, for instance, you're doing automotive systems, there are certain practices you should be following because regulations will push you in a certain direction. But if you're doing, uh, you know, cloud systems, you may use a different approach or an agile based system that uses a different approach so that you get better alignment to your organization practices. 
the outcomes of threat modeling are meaningful when they're of value. So we talked about how we can facilitate them being of value, but then on top of that, the outcomes that you get, the threats, the vulnerabilities, or the discussion, the documentation, whatever the case may be, if that is valuable to you, then threat modeling has, be, has meaning for you. And that's, that's important, right? We want threat modeling to be meaningful, not just, a, a, again, not just the checkbox compliance. So you're not doing this just for compliance. You're doing this because you want to understand the posture of your system. And this last point here, right? Dialogue among stakeholders. Threat modeling is an opportunity to communicate the system and how it works and how it's designed so that you can understand what, what concerns you may have. And, and I say you, meaning collectively as developers or architects or QA or support people or whoever, you know, whoever the stakeholders of the system are. You could, in theory, I guess, get customers involved too if you wanted to, but it's completely optional. Uh, but really, it's a, it's a means of having, having good dialogue and, and good understanding of the system. So those are the principles. Improve, align, meaningful, dialogue, right? Conversation, continuous improvement, and align with organization to get meaningful value. So patterns that we apply. So for threat modeling, a systemic approach. Take that knowledge, right? That remember the blue boxes I highlighted earlier around security engineering principles and your personal views, but also other things like regulations or uh, privacy knowledge or um, attacker, uh, you know, attacker behavior or whatever. Apply that in a systemic approach, a systematic approach, so that you get uh, you get consistency of results. Another pattern that's really important here is informed creativity. Uh, threat modeling is in part craft, in part art, and in part science, right? We, we sometimes say that, you know, you can make it uh, a very scientific way of doing threat modeling where you have, where you identify a model and you identify parts of the system and, and you can do that in a very academic way, but there's a lot of nuance sometimes that comes in, you know, part of threat modeling and facilitating that conversation is really to understand, you know, to, to pull at threads. Oh, so you said X, well, what happened to Y? And, and start pulling that together. And there's some things that you can make science and some things really do take uh, more of that human element to figure out. Uh, and then varied, varied viewpoints, making sure that you have multiple stakeholders in the room when you're doing threat modeling and making sure that everyone has a voice so that they can collaborate effectively is very important for performing threat modeling in a, in a positive way. Having a useful toolkit. So we talked about tools earlier about not making it, you know, not focusing on tools, but really what you want to focus on is having tools that allow you to be effective and productive, right? So having a drawing package, it allows you to build those data flow diagrams uh, in, a, in an effective way so that you get consistent results and, and everyone can understand what's going on or potentially in, in post pandemic world, you know, where folks are not yet back in the office, uh, how do you facilitate conversations across the world, right? And so make sure you use tools, select tools for the process and not, uh, you know, don't feel railroaded by the tools. The tools are there for you to be pro productive. And then lastly, uh, as a pattern, turning theory into practice, right? As you get more involved with threat modeling, as you do more threat modeling, you're going to want to, want to adapt. I mentioned earlier uh, that little tick mark on the diagram, which was which was showing some some detail about uh, which process initiated communications. That is that was an evolution that occurred in terms of certain model modeling types showed certain pieces of information, but it was a need to provide additional information that wasn't part of the normal uh, stencil set. And so we put that, uh, we added that tactic or that technique uh, into the process, right? Modified it by local needs, right? We needed more architectural information in a diagram. And so we put it into practice, took the principles and made it valuable and functional. Some anti-patterns. So things that, if patterns are things that we prefer to stress when it comes to threat modeling, anti-patterns are things we, you know, really, they are, they are potentially going to happen and they are potentially valuable for you and for your organization, but they don't necessarily need to take front and center. Number one, hero threat modeler. Anyone can do threat modeling. 
anyone can do threat polling. Very key, right? You don't necessarily need a security professional there. You don't necessarily need a security team lead there unless your organization requires it, right? So, but anyone really can, everyone really does do threat modeling. And so an anti-pattern is a hero threat modeler. Somebody to swoop in, you don't need somebody to swoop in. I mean, yes, there are consultants who come in, well, you can pay them to do this. And you know what, if you're just getting started, maybe that's what you need to do. But over time, your team should build out the knowledge and capability to be able to do this themselves. Anyone can do it and everyone should be doing it. Be careful of analysis paralysis. We'd like to, as engineers, we often like to, um, you know, keep working on a problem until we get to the, the finest, pot, you know, most granular case we can find and, and really, you know, overanalyze things, want to make sure everything is perfect. That isn't necessarily, that isn't necessary in all cases, right? Goal would be to find solutions earlier and early and often. Uh, unless you're in, say, again, I'll use automotive as an example, where you have you know, a functionally safe environment where you need to be precise and you need to be complete. But that's that, you know, that's not the general case. Be careful again on over-focusing. There's obviously there's often a tendency for folks to, when you're doing threat modeling, to think about, well, okay, I have my I have my crown jewels of the system and nation state X, Y, and Z is coming after me. What are they, what, how are we going to defend against nation state? Don't really worry about that unless you're a government contractor or nation states really are coming after you. But for the general case, be careful about over-focusing on adversaries and assets. And we're worried about that dialogue and that collaboration, that communication. You aren't necessarily going to solve all of the 100% of the security concerns. So I don't, you really can drive yourself crazy if you try. <laughs> and then lastly, Perfect representation. There is no single ideal view of the system. Now, I'm gonna to touch upon a couple of these in the next couple of slides, just to add, add some emphasis here. So when it comes to hero threat modeler, right? Who can perform threat modeling? Everyone, again, I'll stress it again. Everyone can create models and anyone can identify concerns, right? You basically have, just have to know, do you have an understanding of the system? Does that exist within your stakeholders? And then understand that everyone sees sees it from a different angle, right? Everyone who is part, every stakeholder is part of the process is going to find different things or identify different things or call out, you know, your architect may call out that, oh, we designed it this way and your engineer may call it, well, yeah, but that didn't work. So we had to implement it a different way. And now you have a conversation that can happen, right? And then on top of that, remember that threat modeling provides documentation, but it's not, not its goal to do so. Its goal is to help that and drive that conversation. It also provides documentation, which is which is really key. But more important, most importantly from here is that you don't need a single person. There is no hero threat modeler. Anyone can do this. Perfect representation. How many different ways can you model a system? Well, here's at least nine. <laughs> uh, and and Isor's talk is coming up next. Please stick around for that one uh, with respect to encode. But here's nine different ways you can represent a system, and there are certainly more. Uh, and so this is really key, right? Don't don't worry about it if you build a model and then sometime in the future you you model the same system, you come with a different view, or don't try to get to perfect, right? Complete, hundred percent complete. You're never going to get hundred percent complete, almost almost never, unless you unless you basically have one you know one thing and it's really self-contained. So don't worry about it. Use what you, use what you find valuable. Use what you find meaningful. Use what you find enables that dialogue and that conversation, that collaboration, and that's the key part of threat modeling. So with that, I think I'm at time. We started uh, seven minutes after, so I really appreciate it. If there's any questions, I'm willing to entertain them if there is time. Hey, Matthew, uh, thank you very much very very lovely presentation and the way you demystified the threat modeling you know rather than being a fancy techie geek uh, thing <laughs> you made it more you know, like you know simpler including you know the how you should perceive the threat modeling you know what uh, has to be done after you present the analysis slide it has to be a pragmatic review one of the you know attendee mentioned yeah that's true that uh, Threat modeling is a pragmatic review of uh, you know not only the threats but what 
how going to actually impact your current workflow business and the prioritization of it. And uh, the one last one of the last slide that lowly thing you mentioned was uh, how different ways to you know model you know it has to be anything like you know whether back of the napkin or very formal like an UML diagrams and you know thread flow diagrams and business workflow and interjections and commenting and tools. So this is going to be actually very helpful for some of the attendees who are also starting their journey in the infosec. They are in a final year student. Some are. Uh, beginners, practitioners, you know, so very lowly way to, you know, depict this. Well, thank you very much for having me to present and um, I'll pass it over to Izar uh, and I'll answer questions in the chat uh, for those who answered it, asked them during the presentation. I see Izar did type in some answers as well. So mm -hmm. between the two of us, we'll, uh, we'll get you answered. Thank you. I think Izar is yeah, very excited and, you know, he wants to start. <laughs> <laughs> Very valuable, very valuable. This is going to be also be available on demand to over 700 plus uh, attendees who are registered to get and view the webinars for this. So it's going to be equally helpful for them. And we'll also send you the questions, if any, and any collaboration opportunities that uh, our InfoSec professionals are seeking so that, you know, they can work with you, they can work with her in both secure and collaboration and jointly have a secure digital world. Yes.